Hello everyone and welcome back to another Live at Five. I'm Kevin Adkison, the curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And today we are here in Sarnen House in the master bedroom. And I know that last week we didn't have a Live at Five. Uh, and two weeks ago we actually were Live at Fiving also from Sarnen House, but before the students come and take down all of their artwork on Friday, I thought it would be fun just to do another quick walk through Sarnen House and look at some of the pieces from our Speculative Histories exhibition. I know many of you uh, gathered on Sunday to watch Iris Eichenberg, myself, and three of the students talk about 75 pieces of art. Uh, the tour, the exhibition opening, is now online on YouTube. Um, I think it's actually unlisted at the moment, but tomorrow it will be open to the public along with a website that I have possibly been up until three in the morning every night for a week writing. Um, and so that virtual, uh, uh, both the text-based website as well as the 75 minute lecture are going to be on the public uh, cranbrookcenter.edu website. And this show was the fourth intervention in Cranbrook's historic houses of new student work. Uh, it started four years ago when Iris Eichenberg, head of the metalsmith department, and myself uh, invited metalsmithing students and alumni to bring new work to Cranbrook House. Uh, then we did it with the ceramics, the fiber in the metalsmithing department, last year with metalsmithing again, and this year we opened it up to all 11 departments, and I sort of thought that maybe 40 students would sign up, 75 did, which was even better. Um, and so we had quite a bit of artwork on display, and I thought it would be fun today to look at some of my favorite pieces here in the house. Um, we are standing here in front of Alex um, Ukma's piece, which what an hour to be here in Sarnen House and to see this incredible vanity set. Of course, the windows are designed by Aelil Sarnen, the drapery, which often catches people off guard with its ruffles, was designed by Aero Saarinen, very similar to flapper dresses at the time. And normally this incredible dresser set, the lighting as well as the three-part mirror, which were designed by Aero Saarinen and produced by the Caldwell Company, usually this vanity set has Mrs. Sarnen set of hair brushes, shoe horns, um, uh, compact, and everything that Loya Sarnen used here at the dressing table uh, is silver plate or ebony, tortoise shell, really beautiful, fine hair products for Mrs. Sarnen that were bought specifically for this location. And what Alex Umka, who is a second year student about to graduate, um, from the 2D design department. What she wanted to bring into the house uh, were products for textured hair. And so as a black woman artist, she wanted to speculate, which was the, the prompt of our special ex exhibition, was to speculate about other histories in the house. And she wanted to think, what would it have been like if there had been a black family who li uh, lived in Sarnen House? Uh, Cranbrook has never had a black director or president. Uh, and so Alex here brings into the space not only the tools of, of uh, textured hair, but also sayings. And Alex was one of the three artists who told us directly about her work. So when the YouTube video is up, I encourage you to go and listen to her talk about the piece. Uh, but she talks about using play, uh, pieces like the hair iron and not just bringing the, the hot iron here to the house, but then she also laser engraved it with expressions like hold your ear, which is said by mothers or hairdressers to uh, the kids so that as you're using the hot comb, they tell you to hold your ear so that you don't get it 
uh, uh, burnt, or the brush waves on swim, which is, is how you describe the wavy hair, uh, or the pick that says to the roots, talking about both the way that the uh, hair pick gets all the way to the roots of the hair, but also to the roots as a African American. Um, and then tilt your head and you tender headed because this wide tooth comb is used by people uh, who have really curly hair. And so it, it helps to get uh, uh, deep into the roots and something that is said while you use it is if you know, if you say, ouch, then the person will say you tend to headed. And so I love that Alex brought in this very different, um, uh, very different sort of product, uh, that is different from the sort of, uh, European Caucasian hair. Uh, and it's a different sort of set of voices and expressions than this sort of Scandinavian, uh, uh, American, uh, white American tradition that we usually have on display here in Sarnen House. Now, right next to it, a very different way of speculating on history uh, is a piece by Vikram, who is in our newest department, the 4D department. And 4D, for those of you who don't know it, um, it's a department that's exploring sort of the very cutting edge of art and design, whether that's robotics or 3D printing, new media, um, projection mapping. It's really a place where uh, uh, as much as any one design media, if 2D design is graphic design, 3D is product design, 4D is, is everything that's new. And I think Vikram's project does a pretty good job of expressing the kind of work that's happening in our newest department where he has built a robot um, or a, a computer program. Uh, and so the, the little motor here is running up and down with this pin. And so the pin is actually held in place by the motor. You'll see that there's counterweights on the edge of the machine. And when this is running, the pin is going to zoop up and start writing a new letter. And you think, okay, that's cool enough, Vikram, but how did you actually write this letter? And what he did was he took letters from Aero Sarnen to Aileen Lushine, his second wife, and he sent the letters into a computer program that uses artificial intelligence to combine and write new love letters. And so, he took the actual language of the, the young couple and he put it into a computer program that then wrote all new love letters. They're sort of nonsensical and they begin to sort of, uh, because the program is taking all sorts of human syntax, they begin to say very strange things to each other that Arrow and Aileen could never have said, like, please visit my website, my darling. Um, so it's it's a little bit bizarre, but for Vikram, he was interested in bringing the sort of conversations and the the love, the romance of the house and bringing it in this very new form, sort of can artificial intelligence tell us these new stories. Uh, and I just love the way that it sort of folds out and comes running down the hallway. We'll see other work by students like Julian Jones in the print media department, where he designed this beautiful uh, textile in the computer and in design, and then have it woven on jacquard looms in the Carolinas. Now, another piece is this uh, two-part series where you have a glass bead here, a single glass bead, and then this textile from Meredith Morrison in our fiber department, where she's used glass beads to create this long sort of uh, runner-esque shape. But in the giant glass bead, she has filled it with blueberry powder. And this is actually what Meredith Morrison eats every day. And she began to think about this room as a sort of sacred space. This is where the Sarnins, Mr. and Mrs. Sarnin, sat for breakfast every day. And she thought of this as almost like a measure of the ritual of breakfast. So you sit and eat blueberry powder every morning and the bead gets more and more empty. Now, what I didn't know when I installed this piece here, um, uh, the, the blueberry bead uh, is actually related to quite beautifully to this curtain behind, which this is a reproduction woven by Cranbrook alums in the 1990s with 
dye with t- uh, uh, blue fabric that is actually dyed with blueberries. And so this is a Swedish textile or Swedish skein of wool. And when Greg was working, uh, the director of the center was working on the restoration, he couldn't find an American producer to get him this correct shade of blue. Finally, they ordered it from Sweden and they realized that the trick was that the Swedish companies were still using blueberry extract. And that was this very subtle color that Loya Saarinen used in 1930 and that Greg had such a hard time finding in 1990. In the corner is a little piece by the head of our uh, fiber department, Mark Newport, one of his uh, uh, repaired pieces, where this is a long series of work that he's been doing, where he creates a hole inside the textile, and then he has sat and quite ritualistically, if not methodically, began to repair the textile by reweaving the warp and weft using embroidery th- thread. And so what do we sort of value as a society of newness, of of restoration, of sort of repair? Across uh, the beds, Melika has added uh, what she calls a sort of illegible language. And so these are pieces that uh, to the artist, maybe they have meaning, uh, but to us as the viewer, we're left a little bit, uh, if not in the dark, we're, we're not told exactly what these pieces mean, but they seem to communicate to each other. They seem to hold meaning within themselves. And she uh, 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 leaves them sort of arranged across the beds. Now we'll say hello to our curator here and then step inside the bathroom where this is the bath mat that Loya Sarnen designed for the room around 1930. And Kaya, Kaya uh, who is a first year in uh, the sculpture department, I believe, has created a reproduction of that bath mat, but now in aquarium rocks. And so she's asked me to, to film her as she sweeps the piece up uh, on Friday. Uh, but you can sort of get in here and see that it is the same floral design from Mrs. Sarnen's rug, but entirely loose pebbles. There, I proved that it was loose. It did take her about uh, 10 a.m. until 7 p.m. to hand set all of these pebbles, and she called it uh, Loya's Lagoon, and she was interested in thinking of Loya Sarnen and the sort of ritualistic aspect of taking a bath and the sort of uh, almost baptismal quality, the cleansing power, the mysteries of water and of what you find in water. On the bathroom mirror here, we see Cranbrook's, um, one of our great librarians, but also an alumni, uh, alumna of the painting department, Rachel Pontius, who has made us a painting that has a real thickness to it. So it reads as if it is made of tile. Uh, it's, it's not. And then in the center, there's this lovely glass designed by Pipson, Sarn, and Swanson that she has depicted with wine in the bottom and then the red lipstick there. On the other side, sort of wandering through the bath uh, or across the table is this strange jellyfish-like creature with steel legs and then the inside featuring uh, cast in this resinous material um, sort of botanic forms, condoms, a shrimp tail. Uh, not sure if that is a reference to the Great Cinnamon Toast Crunch Crisis that's happening. Uh, this was older than the Cinnamon Toast Crunch scandal. But I do like how we placed Lyric Shin's piece here, and it looks as if it's running across the bath counter. Now, I'm not going to go through every piece here in the house on today's Live at Five. I just want to point out some of the highlights and encourage you tomorrow to head over to center.cranbrook.edu and see for yourself the complete listing of artist installations across Cranbrook House, Sarnen House, and the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House. 
Uh, there's an ear in the closet here. Um, I apologize for forgetting the name of the student who brought me her ear. And then down in the first floor, uh, there are a few objects that we're going to keep on display. And so as a, uh, uh, a, a juried competition between Susan Ewing, director of the Art Museum, Greg Whitcop, director of the center, myself and Iris, we selected 10 artists whose works are going to be kept on display throughout the tour season. So I'm not sure all 10 were actually watching on Sunday, so they might not all know that they have been given such an honor. Um, but if they agree to loan us their pieces through the end of uh, uh, the tour season at Thanksgiving, you'll be able to see some of these pieces on tour. Uh, and that includes Annie Meyer uh, from the 3D design department who gave us this study that's meant to be like a toy of unknown or a game of unknown instructions. And she's interested in creating what she calls non-binary objects, objects that uh, make us consider and reconsider the sort of fluid state of uh, identity and of art and design. It has this beautiful milk paint finish that the brightness is causing it to be a little overexposed here, but the colors are really just fabulous with the house. And so you are meant to sort of play with these as if it is some sort of game uh, with unclear instructions. And she told me that I could rearrange them at will uh, to sort of engage with this playful aspect here in the book room where we know that the Saarinans and especially their grandchildren love to play games and race cars around on the counter. Now, one of my very favorite pieces in the show is what I call the alternative Primavera vase, what Cooper Siegel, the artist, calls the uh, uh, Altelier Primavera slumped. And so you'll know from a few weeks ago on Live at Five, where we discussed the Altelier Primavera vase from Paris from the mid-1930s, and how this vase was created on the potter's wheel and then adding a glaze and combing the glaze off. And so that is the sort of thickness of the glaze running through the comb pattern. What Cooper has done is made an alternative version where his sort of non-functional vase, because it's not watertight, is made up of stacked layers of glazed and unglazed rings uh, that are then stacked up and they sort of slump over onto the very um, uh, kiln brick where it was fired. And so as the piece fired, it fell over and has become uh, integrally attached to the kiln brick. That's part of the infrastructure of how you actually fire these pieces. Um, I just love the sort of aesthetic quality of this. It, it makes us, it draws our eye to the original Atelier Primavera and then it makes us sort of reconsider the figure and form and how one might see a process, see those stripes and think, well, how could I achieve that? And Cooper seems to be proposing one such attempt at reproduction uh, that ultimately creates this, this either profound failure of, of mimicry or I think much more intentional, this sort of profound sibling to the Atelier Primavera piece. Uh, underneath the Victor Schreckengost Pegasus, we see uh, one of our fiber students, I, I think this is Kelly Croner, who has added in a little quilted meadow for the Pegasus. And then one of the most subtle pieces of the show uh, is simply here on the bookshelf. And uh, McKenna Quint uh, decided to add in a single book into the shelf. Uh, so among all of the leather and gold bindings of the Sarnens collection in uh, German, there's some Swedish, there's French, Russian, Finnish, as well as English books, she has added a Cook's Tour of Iowa, which she bought at John King Bookstore because she's from Iowa, and then was quite shocked when she found that her grandfather was actually in this book, had no idea it was there. And so her piece is um, uh, as much process, the sort of act of replacing the Sarnen's book, as it is the creation of an object. It's the sort of power of slipping in a book that doesn't quite belong into this historic context. 
Now, Malik Purvis created a frame of the shadow of the frame of Helene Schefferbecke uh, in her pastel reproduction that usually hangs on this wall. And Malik was inspired by this idea of speculative histories of the memory of innate objects, that this pastel by Schefferbecke, uh, in fact, had no agency but was able to create a, a shadow line. And so the sort of what is the, the power of the object over its environment when you give it enough time and enough sort of natural forces? So time, sunlight, and it's just sort of standing still has created this blank uh, place. And now Malik has added in his frame of this shadow with a Japanese burning finish on it. And you can see just the way my hand is making a shadow that is simply from the power of uh, the sunlight coming in these gorgeous west-facing windows and reflecting off of the wax polish floor. If you have questions as we move about our tour, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, we'll just look at a couple of more pieces here, and then I will ask you to go over to the website to see all the rest of the pieces that we've skipped over. Um, Gloria Wynn, uh, who is a metalsmithing student, created versions of the Saarinen's dolls, but in charcoal, and instead of sitting on Loya Saarinen's Raya rug, our two little figures say uh, are sitting on this um, fiery hooked rug, uh, ominous thing to bring fire and coal into a historic house. It's just about the biggest nightmare we could have. Um, but these two figures sit across from the Catholic Cruz uh, uh, doll and the other boy doll there. And those dolls on the far side belong to Aero Saarinen. And so it creates this interesting conversation between pretty creepy dolls. Now, this painting by former uh, president of Cranbrook Academy of Art, head of drawing, director of the Art Museum, Wallace Mitchell, born in Detroit here at Cranbrook from 1931 until 1977. Uh, he painted this in the mid-1930s. The Sarnins bought it and hung it here in their cozy corner. And the head of the painting department, Martha Maisko, created on the opposite side a sort of uh, new version of Wallace Mitchell's painting. So if we take Wally Mitchell's flowers and then look at Martha Mice goes, what she has done is she's used a sort of Google image of Wally Mitchell's arrangement. So you can just see the face there, the flowers sticking up. She's really changed the contrast so that his subtle peaches become these bright fluorescent pinks. Then she has layered it onto a James Hafner photograph of the cozy corner, which you see coming down around it. And then she has added in these painted flowers that were scanned. And so she hand painted the flowers and then pressed them as if you were pressing them into a book, but instead on a flatbed scanner. And so then she layers it all into a digital collage and has it professionally printed on a sheet of aluminum. She then adds this upholstered frame, uh, which is the sort of ombre effect from green to purple. And she meant this to be the sort of absorption of the green of the cozy corner rug into her frame. And so we can step back and see the way that her piece is sort of depicting in an abstract way this room and the memory of the Wally Mitchell painting there. I see that Vikram has now joined our live tour and we have already discussed your project upstairs. So after I post this, uh, you can go back and watch me either describe your piece or get mad as I ruin your piece. But I think I knew, I think I talked well about it. Um, if anyone has any questions, type them in. Uh, is the frame actually burnt? Yes, so it's a Japanese uh, uh, finish. Um, that Andrew uh, Lewandowski uh, at the Cranbrook Woodshop taught Malik to do. So it's a process that he learned uh, in our woodshop here and then he used on the frame to sort of uh, burn and lacquer the frame. Now, another of the pieces that's going to stay in the house for our tour season, if Claire agrees, 
um, is Claire uh, Tabull from uh, the ceramics department, and she made this gorgeous peony vase. Um, it's made of porcelain, but she's been unhappy with it, and so she has uh, made and remade, fired and refired, constantly adding different finishes. And so in the version that she brought here to Speculative History, she adds this green glaze dripping down to help tie it further into the Saarinen house. Now from here, we can head to our last couple of pieces in the tour, including Douglas Jones, who's a student in our print media department, he was interested in looking at Aelil Saarinen's desk. So the desk itself was designed by Aero Saarinen. Aelil did sit here. Uh, when Doug came through the house, he saw what was essentially my own creation, my um, uh, creation of a uh, sort of historic scene using reproductions. And Doug Jones was inspired and he said, don't take away the urn and the sarin and drawings. I want to interact with those. But he then brought in new things. So he brought in this sort of pointillist swan uh, that he designed relating to both the Kingswood swans, but also the swans that are found in various Finnish myths. And then he added a bookmark of his own design and he brought in a copy of The Souls of Black Folk. And he pointed out the fact that The Souls of Black Folk and George Booth's The Pleasures of Planting, planting were written around the same time. And The Pleasures of Planting, planting is a book that uh, is, is in the Sarnen House Library. And so Doug Jones was sort of uh, uh, reimagining what Mr. Sarnen might have on his desk. Now, the last piece that I'll point out for us is this little cell phone uh, designed by uh, or created by Elizabeth Diamond, Beth Diamond. And she envisions the Saarinans uh, having these strange sort of uh, ceramic cell phones laying around the house. And there is one that has a picture of yours truly giving a live at five tour. Uh, in the house, and I, I appreciate her incorporation of things. She was picturing the Sarnans getting calls on their cell phones from the past and the future. So that's a very young, handsome Aelil Sarnan from Finland calling his desk here in America. And then elsewhere in the house, uh, she has a picture of me doing a live at five to the Sarnans from the future. I hope you enjoyed this look at just a few of the pieces from our Speculative Histories student intervention here at Sarnen House. Uh, the tour is going to be posted on YouTube, the full event with professional photography from Eric Perry uh, on tomorrow afternoon. There'll also be a virtual website where you can click through Cranbrook House, Sarnen House, and the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House and see all of the student work and some of the pieces that I didn't discuss ahead and behind me. Thanks so much for joining us for a new, uh, another Live at Five. I'm sorry I missed last week. We had a standing meeting um, looking at Desislava's piece there in the courtyard, uh, wrapping uh, Kiwi's muse. There's going to be some changes that are coming up here to Instagram Live at Five in the near future. And uh, we are probably going to be losing the Instagram Weekly Live at Five. I know that is tough news to hear for those of you, my uh, most loyal family, our, our family and followers, including my family, Lynette, uh, Terry, others who are always here. Um, but as we continue to get back to our new normal and as the work of the center continues apace, doing these twice a week, um, we just have to critically consider uh, how long this can go. So unfortunately, that means that April is probably going to see the winding down of the Instagram Tuesday Live at 5. The Facebook Live at 5 on Wednesdays are not going anywhere. So if you are on Facebook, you can still catch me there. If you are not on Facebook and you're devastated at this news, I am always happy to email you links to the Facebook Live at Fives, uh, and you can see them after the fact without a Facebook account. 
That doesn't mean I'm never going to be back here on Instagram doing the live at five. It just might not be every Tuesday. It could be a, a different day of the week or just select Tuesdays. So make sure that you keep following Cranbrook Center here on Instagram and look in the stories for when I announce a live at five coming up. Because I have a hard, hard time saying goodbye, I'll probably be back next Tuesday for another Live at Five where I will again repeat this uh, tragic me message that I hope is the worst news of your month. Uh, if that's true, you're having a great month. So I hope everyone's safe. I hope you're all wearing masks and making good decisions. And I hope that you'll head over to center.cranbrook.edu to check out the student show when it is fully posted online um, hopefully by the end of the day tomorrow. Uh, this project was a lot of fun. I want to thank all the students who participated and gave uh, really a great deal of thought and effort uh, into the design and the creation of these art objects. I also want to thank Iris Eichenberg for working alongside me and Leslie Mayo, our registrar, for helping with historic research and uh, image collection. And I really want to give a shout out to Alyssa Seelman Rutkowski, uh, the center's incredible administrative assistant, who if I have been up until the wee hours writing the website and designing the website and making quotes, she has been the one who's actually working with our pretty horrendous web system uh, to try and make the virtual gallery a real thing, a living institution. If you've enjoyed Live at Fives, if you've enjoyed the student show, we always uh, are appreciative of your support. Uh, and you can head over to center.cranbrook.edu. We have a donate button and these free tours are made possible through our paid programming and through support from viewers like you. So uh, certainly if you enjoy this and you are able to, we appreciate a donation and I appreciate if you put uh, that you're giving it for live at five. It's been a pleasure being underworked are overworked and underpaid here at Cranbrook and taking you on a all these journeys uh, across the past year. And it will see, we will see each other again very soon, I'm sure, especially if you're on Facebook, I'll be back there tomorrow. Until next time, everyone, I hope you get out into the sun and enjoy the beautiful day. Uh, I'm Kevin Atkinson with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. Until next time.